Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello. Hi, my name is Martina, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my home group is Spirit of Freedom on the Gold Coast. You're all welcome on a Tuesday night. Uh, welcome to the Aussie Paw Convention. Um, some housekeeping. Um, the toilets are, I'm sure you guys have all figured out where the toilets are. They're right there in the foyer. Um, smoking is all the way to the right side as you leave the building. Um, there's some butt cans there. And tea and coffee are available all day long in the foyer. Um, in case of emergency, um, <laughs> meet at the bottom of the stairs. Um, uh, the AA preamble. Um, and I'll now hand that over. No, I'm going to read the preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement is for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And I'll hand it over to Courtney. Too short for this. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Courtney and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Uh, the format of this meeting is that we have two guest speakers sharing for 10 minutes each. We will then be selecting people from around the room to share for five minutes each, concluding the meeting with a final 10-minute guest speaker. Speakers will get a one-minute wrap-it-up card along with a finished card. <laughs> if you've already been asked to share at this convention, please decline to give others a chance. The topic for this meeting is facing indecision. Ask God, then take it easy. The reading comes from the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, page 86. Facing indecision. Ask God, then relax and take it easy. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may, we may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought or decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We are often surprised how right the answers come after we have tried this for a while. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes part of the working mind. Being still in experience and having just made conscious contact with God, it is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We come to rely upon it. Thank you. I will now call our first speaker, uh, Tiffany I from Bray Park. Oh, well, that took the wings out of my sails because she read the part I was going to read. <laughs> Hi, my name's Tiffany. I'm an alcoholic. Sorry, my um, I feel very privileged to be asked. On this is really nerve-wracking for me. My first line of all I could think of was uh, being asked to. Um, about facing indecisions and I'm really undecided about what I'm going to share. But um, for me, like I had to really, like I've been thinking about this for a while and of course I did the alcoholic thing, you know, at two o'clock in the morning and, you know, did about six shares in my head before I handed it over and, you know, that's usual for me. I don't think I'm alone there. And um, 
that part that she just wrote on page 86, just before it, is actually, I've lost my spot. What I really like is just before it is actually, under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance for, after all, God gave his brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. And for me, indecision comes when I ain't too sure about my motives. That's when indecision shows up, when it's the, am I getting something I want but at the cost of something else? Do you know what I mean? Like, that's when my indecision comes up. I, um, I was given an opportunity, actually, not that long ago, uh, quite recently, actually, and... Um, Uh, it was an opportunity presented to me from a, a friend of a friend, but my partner's not talking to the friend that knows the friend, right? So I've been given offered something by this person and, and instantly my brain's gone, oh, I'm going to murky the waters, oh, no, I can't do this, I can't do it, I can't accept it. And I had to sit down, I actually had to pray about it, and my uncomfortability, of course, was doing something that may hurt my partner. But what I realised is I wasn't actually dealing with that person, I was dealing with another person and it was a purely business deal. And that, you know, because it's funny, because my first thought isn't always right. You know, I'm not always... For me, stuff's done at a gut level. Um, but for me, at the end of the day, it, it's not about me, it's about God. It's about that... When I hit that, that bump and my gut does that flip-flop and I go, oh, hold on, I'm not comfortable. I have to make a decision here, you know. It's about that wait, stop, pause, you know. And then I used to do the, uh, the cower and the hide and the, if I don't make a decision, then I'm not going to have to worry about it. But actually not making a decision is also a decision also. <laughs> so you, can't, you don't get out of it that way. So... Um, I just, sorry, I feel really nervous, I really do, um, and I feel a bit out of my depth right now, because uh, what do I have to say? I'm very much a simple alcoholic. I, uh, I came into recovery at 20, it was uh, 1999, and uh, I thought it was awesome, thought it was great, because all of a sudden there was a bunch of people who could never tell me to go away. They couldn't kick me out. And then I found this really awesome thing called this social network of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's great. You drink heaps of coffee, you talk, you neg rave, you tell all your stories. You don't really change much, except you're drinking coffee. You know, and I did that for a while, and I hurt for a long while. Uh, and then I, uh, uh, and then I relapsed, and I went away to Melbourne, and I came back to the Gold Coast Fellowship, and I was uh, two months sober and three months pregnant at 22, at 21, sorry, and and then started my journey. I, uh, funny enough, one of my old sponsors is sitting right there for that period of time, and. Uh, yeah, I started my journey of recovery. I did the, the, the 12 steps. I got into service. I didn't pray much. You know, I got into the working side. So I moved from the social side of Alcoholics Anonymous to the working side of it, where I did so much service, and did so much judgment on everybody else who didn't do service, you know, and uh, decided that I had come, you know, was, was it because I did service. And, uh, you know, I learned my lesson then. And I uh, relapsed after 11 years of recovery. And I relapsed for nine months. In that journey of learning that I was the service guru of Alcoholics Anonymous, I also got a husband and made him my higher power. So that was great. When he <laughs> left, so did my recovery. <laughs> you know. And then, uh, so for nine months I drank. And I came back in again. And... Uh, I tell you, after a little while, those doors really do get thinner and thinner. But I know that I have a message of hope. Because the simple reason is I'm still standing here and I'm still surviving. And sometimes I'm even thriving, depending on the day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I came back in 
and I got a sponsor and I got, I got really introduced to the 12 steps. And, and I started to have a spiritual awakening and it started, to, it started to happen for me. I didn't feel ill at ease in my own skin. You know, I didn't have to worry so much about getting it wrong. You know, I didn't feel like I was living on that knife's edge, you know. <laughs> That's a lot of my recovery has been that knife's edge where you're just not too sure if you're doing enough and you're not too sure if you're falling away, you know. And I didn't, wasn't living like that. I was living free. Shoulders started to go back and then I got to my ninth step. And I had a massive resentment. My book literally flew across the room. <laughs> I threw it. There ain't no way I'm making amends to them. I have any idea what they've done to me. And it took me six months, and I went back out there for one night. Funny enough, after I had a fight with the person I had a resentment with. One night, and in that one night, I lost custody of my daughter, I lost my house, I ended up on my sponsor's floor, sleeping on a mattress for three months, and we started again. And for me, that's been the most amazing journey. I have 18 months now. I'm still on my ninth step. <laughs> still on my ninth step. But I haven't thrown the book yet. <laughs> and I have started. I did go back. I didn't start my ninth step. I went back to step one. I don't believe in this have a bust and pick up on the step you're on. I don't believe in that. Because obviously there's something missing if you picked up a drink. You know? And um, I guess in some ways, you know, my whole story is about facing indecision. Am I in or am I out? You know? What am I going to do today? Am I going to work further from my last drink or am I going to work closer to my next bust? You know? Because that's what it comes down to. I mean, we can all become spiritual gurus, but the simple reason is you pick up a drink, you're a drunk. <laughs> you know? Bring it back. Look at it in reality. We hurt those we love. It's not just, oh, my spirituality isn't as fine-tuned today. I lose people. I hurt people. You know? I lose myself. That's the greatest gift that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me, is at the end of the day, I've got me. You know, what I have to say will be met with two responses, either condemn Contempt or revelation of what I say. But that actually has nothing to do with me. That's everybody else's business. All I can say is this is my truth. It's a one-minute warning. It's going to blow. <laughs> In all seriousness, and, you know, the, the, the thing that does actually make, you know, we're deadly serious about our alcoholism, but the rest of it, we've got to laugh. You gotta laugh at the mistakes you make. None of us are getting out alive, kids. None of us are getting out alive. So you might as well have a laugh while you're here and enjoy it. I'm sober enough to remember what I've done and what I've said. I remember the last dirty joke I told. You know? I haven't done anything today that has stopped my dignity or my integrity being in place. And that for me means more than anything. I have integrity today. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'll do it. If I tell you I'm not going to do something, I won't do it. I know myself. That's a life beyond my wildest dreams. Nobody can make me do anything. I don't have to be in relationships I don't want to be in with people I don't want to be in with. You know? I'm free. And I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> Thank you. And our second speaker, guest speaker, is Diana from New Zealand. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm from Auckland, and I'm over here for the weekend. And it feels real privileged to be asked to um, come here and share and feel really nervous actually and what was suggested to me was that I shut my eyes and let God guide me. So if it doesn't go very well, you know who to blame. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I started uh, drinking when I was 14. I didn't drink every day, but when I did, it was so good because I could be the person that I thought that I wanted to be. And, you know, underneath it all, I was always unbearably insecure and too shy and life was hard. And it started there and my journey took me to Australia um, and I started using other drugs and I tried AA for a long time before I eventually cleaned up and um, yeah I was one of those really tragic relapses that just didn't get it and um, I'm never judgmental on anybody that's really struggling because, you know, I was one of those people that people really didn't think I'd ever clean up. I even really surprised myself. I knew step one really well for at least six years. I knew I was powerless over drugs and alcohol. I knew my life was a mess. I just didn't have any self control when it came to using and um, it wasn't actually step one that cleaned me up it was actually step two um, somebody had said to me um, you're happy to put up your hand and say hi I'm Diana I'm, I'm an alcoholic but you don't know what it means to be an alcoholic and when you know what that means you'll turn your life around and it was just like absolutely bang on and I got the picture straight away because I was happy. I just thought I was just playing the game. I was just going along with, you know, whatever, you know, I, I, I couldn't stop drinking so I was just happy to do whatever it took. Um, but I did, wasn't feeling it. And as soon as I could identify with all those other traits of an alcoholic, I could get it, and that's what step two for me was about, was seeing that what I was doing, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I didn't know that what I was doing was just a little bit nutty. And so as soon as I could see that module, I was just on the right track. And, and, and I've been strong in my recovery ever since, and it's because I always hold that fear. I do everything I'm told in recovery because of the fear of ever going back. And I love going to lots and lots of meetings because it gives me that daily reminder, that daily <coughs> practice of not forgetting where I came from. And I know I carry the disease of denial. I can come up with a series of events, just a slightly different perspective on how other people see life. And I, I really need that. I need people to keep me uh, in my correct thinking. Yeah, I can come up with a really good version quite a lot. That relax and take it easy topic was a good one for me because I found this quite stressful being asked to share at a convention. I didn't know who was going to be there, how many people. And so it really required a lot of faith. And um, I decided what's worked for me in the past and my past 12 years, I've had a really beautiful connection with God. It isn't just a label. It isn't just an image. It's something, it's a choice. And every day I choose to take faith. I choose to do an action. I choose to go to meetings. I choose to do daily readings. I'll, um, I'll make a decision in a day when I have something difficult on to just choose this path, this AA path. And so far, it's only been a really beautiful thing in my life. Um, my mantra is um, acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I accept who I am and what I am, life is beautiful. And that relax and take it easy, man, it's a beautiful place to be. It comes from peace of mind. Peace of mind comes from making that choice to choose faith. And that's why I'm here today. And I thank you all for this one.
Alrighty, our uh, next speaker, Carlos from Byron Bay. If he's here. Oh, okay. Hi, Carlos. Uh, Lee from New Farm Thursday night. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. alright. <laughs> Not Lee. <laughs> sure, <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leah. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Wow, indecision. It's a Stuff just actually started, light bulbs went off for me just then because um, my family liked to tell funny stories about me as a kid with indecision and I, my grandma especially, I remember she took um, my brother and I to a toy store and I would have been about six or seven and he was about three or four um, and um, he just went straight for the football and she retells this story all the time and I could not decide which thing I wanted and this went on and on to the point where I was in an absolute state um, and this behaviour never stopped. Um, and it's I only remember that story just then and it all kind of made decision because, again, and I think um, the previous speaker was talking about it, just the motivation behind decision-making. And, you know, in that situation, it's like, oh, well, maybe I want this and um, this could be better. Or um, And through my life, um, the motives have been around, well, maybe this is a better situation, you know, or this strategy or these people or these things or... and. Um, I've come to know now that all of this was about um, really searching for things that made me feel whole from the outside um, and the pain around that because it was never, it never worked, it was never good enough, it wasn't, um, I never solved the problem, I was still in pain um, and, and drinking actually helped completely get rid of that feeling. Um, um, also, another an, another um, factor to indecision is perfectionism, and this is such a horrible situation to be in because it's sort of like that. That's not the outside, but that's the r horrible expectations that I have or had, still working through, obviously, on myself, where it's sort of like, well, I have to be better, and this isn't good enough, and you have to. You know, and so working through all of that and that causing pain from inside. Um, and um, I think now, um, and I'm uh, about um, almost two years and two months sober, um, and um, I'm, I'm working with my sponsor still. Um, I'm, I'm taking someone through the book. Um, I'm doing service. I have a great group. Um, but most importantly, I'm working these steps daily. And um, these steps have helped me understand and have, you know, I didn't even know what an inventory was. I had no idea that this was a tool that could be used to understand my motives, um, the, the pain that I'm feeling. And now whenever I get to that point and I go, oh, my God, something's going wrong here, um, I actually have to stop and go, all right, where's this coming from, you know, and what's motivating me to think this way um, um, and know which direction. So, yeah, I am um, incredibly grateful um, um, to have found this program and, um, yeah, and working it daily. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm Andrew and I'm a proud alcoholic Hi. and it's been my pleasure to uh, be part of the committee for this convention. Uh, 
So, um, you know, two years ago, I was a man dying alone of this disease. Um, and my life was tiny, and I was just about disappearing up my own ass. <laughs> but, you know, and <laughs> literally, you know, it was just, um, it's a crude way, but, you know, I, um, I, I'd run out of options in life. So it was just, you know, I, I, I was frozen by fear. Um, every day, there wasn't a right way, I started doing nothing. The only thing that drove me was, in the end, was to make money so I could um, pay the rent so I'd have somewhere to drink and I'd be able to buy alcohol. There was, there was nothing else, you know. And, you know, all I can say is fear drove me for so many years to the point, and I'd keep on trying to keep myself safe, but it kept on making my life smaller. You know, and alcohol created this illusion of a safe space at the end of the day. I was a nightly binge drinker. I drank as much as I could. But in the end, and towards the end of my drinking, even alcohol didn't work. It wouldn't shut down my brain unless I totally passed out. Um, and, you know, I, I could just shut myself down completely or I'd be awake and I'd be full of fear. I'd feel like... Something, something was crushing my guts every day. Um, and it was just, you know, it was, it was a torturous existence. And I just couldn't keep on going this way. And, um, you know, I, and I think it's God given that it, it was a remarkable thing that I'd helped somebody out and then they helped me out. Um, I think I had a little bit of humi- uh, uh, humanity left and I. Um, and I helped somebody out for no other reason than they needed a hand. Um, an old woman who had survivor skill, she'd lost her son to cancer. I supported her, and then she supported me. And I, and I remember, and I thought, somebody cares about me. You know, maybe I'm worth saving, because I've never had that any time in my life. I always thought, um, deep down, I thought I was worthless, and I wasn't. I always wondered what the point was. So, you know, and... And one day I just added myself and I said I can't stop drinking to one of my bosses. And, and I was, it was remarkable because I thought nobody cared a shit about Andrew, but uh, everybody jumped to support me, you know. And, uh, you know, and I was in a detox two weeks later and a week later I was in AA. And coming into these rooms, I was, um, you know, I, I felt remarkably alone. I felt... I had got nothing in common with these people, but I had the arrogance of, a, uh, you know, judging from the gutter, and I thought I was better than everybody else. I was comparing, to my, I was saying, how am I different to all these people? And, you know, I can proudly say, two years later, I uh, relate to every single person I hear in these rooms. Um, so, you know, but what this is about is finding God and then then God God guide my thinking. And um, I feel so sad that when I hear people in the rooms and people in my life that are in AA who um, are faced by dilemma, indecision, by stress and worry, that they forget God. Because what saved me was getting down on my knees You know, and giving up running my own life because where I was trying to keep myself safe was killing me. And um, all I can say to anybody that's coming in, this is, it's frightening doing, um, it's so unfamiliar, it's so strange to be so honest and to um, expose yourself. But it's, you know, it, it's not safe doing it on your own. We need each other. Thank you. Uh, I will now call the final guest speaker, Lisa T from Sutton's Beach. I'm Lisa, I'm an alcoholic addict, and my home group is the Thursday night topic meeting and 
um, at Redcliffe and the Saturday topic meeting at Sutton's Beach. Um, yeah, um, that's awesome. Um, sheer, um, yeah, um, true humility, eh? Um, so, yeah, it's everything I've needed. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I'm really um, happy to be here today. I'm very privileged. Um, yeah, so uh, facing indecision. Um, yeah, um, do I have a big book? Um, yeah, um, I think, you know, when I was looking at this, I was thinking, oh, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you tell people, you know? Um, you know, a, a lot of people come into the fellowship, they stay sober and they get stuck and they kill themselves sober, you know? Um, unfortunately, it is the reality of this disease. I lost um, many friends that way, um, in and outside the rooms, um, and some died sober and some didn't. And, um, you know, and, uh, page 25 tells me there is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the levelling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for successful, successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others and we had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. When therefore we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us to do but pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven and we have been rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. And that tells me um, AA has given me uh, a kit of spiritual tools. Uh, it's up to me whether I use them or not, you know, and if I don't use them, um, I'm um, usually faced with um, a lot of pain. And um, so those tools for me today um, is my steps. Um, if I'm not sure about something, I'm, I'm not sure about behaviours that I'm going through or the way I've been behaving, if I'm, I'm not happy about my relationships, if I'm not happy about something, we have an inventory. And um, it's called putting pen to paper. And I hated it. It sucked. And um, I had to do it. And um, I had to do it every time. And it's what my sponsor, um, you know, always said to me, well, what have you done about it? What have you written about it? What, have you written that down yet? Have you written your list? And, and, you know, don't come see me until you've written it all down, you know. And um, those, um, those the, you know, the, those fourth steps that I did when I was in severe pain, when I wanted to kill myself rather than stay sober, um, you know, because um, that was an option, you know. And this is the way ins insane people think. This is the way addicts think and alcoholics think, you know. Um, it was all familiar and um, comfortable to me. To just, you know, well, 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 just stuff it all, you know. Like one, you know, put your hands up in the air and just go, well, fuck it all, you know. That, I've always lived like that. I'd always lived like that until I got given a kit of spiritual tools, which my sponsor so patiently took me through and, um, and was kind enough to listen to me and um, show me compassion and, and um, you know, and accept me when I couldn't accept myself. You know, and love me when I couldn't love myself. So, yeah, so um, my, my steps are my spiritual tool. My prayer and meditation is my um, spiritual tool. Um, my service is my spiritual tool. Doing service in my district, doing service, um, you know, taking people to meetings. You know, people I don't even want to take to meetings. That's the hard stuff, you know, <laughs> especially when they ring you and they go, hey, no, and I go, oh, God, I'm going to take that guy. Yeah, I'll take you, you know. And, um, and, you know, plenty of times I've had that happen, you know. I've, I've been in meetings and I've had resentments again, this person or that person or whatever, and I've rung my sponsor. They just freaking rang me and asked me to take them to the meeting. My sponsor says, take them to the meeting. Take them to the meeting, buy them dinner. You know? So, yeah. You know, it's it's that stuff that, you know, I, I live in a, a fantasy world that I can just keep avoiding everyone and everything. Well, that's bullshit. I can't. I can't keep avoiding my program. I can't keep avoiding you. I can't keep avoiding us. I can't keep avoiding 
my responsibilities in AA, you know. That's not why I believe I was given the gift of sobriety, so that I could go around avoiding, you know. Uh, it's it's an action program, um, you know, and, um, you know, uh, thank God for Bill W. I found this on the internet, so awesome. Indecision eventually becomes a decision. So Bill W says, and I thought everyone would like that little poster. Um, and uh, I couldn't believe it when I came across it. You know, I, I looked up in the, um, on, the, on Google, indecision, and bang, that came up. And I was like, yeah, I like it, you know. Um, so straight from the founder's mouth, you know, um, you know, you decide to do nothing. Well, you know what? Someone will decide to do it for you, and you may not like it. Um, because, you know, this is what happens, you know. Um, I lost things because people got sick of my shit, you know, and they made decisions for me because I wasn't well enough to make decisions for myself. And, um, you know, and, and it's hard. It's hard putting down ba- boundaries, you know. It's it's really difficult to place boundaries in my life with the people that I love and the people that I've known for many years and, you know, and, and that's usually my family and people that I care about. It's hard to put boundaries down in my life and make decisions around um, my recovery and my self-worth and, um, and you know, you can, I can guarantee they're not going to be happy about it. And they do not like it. And they kick and they scream. And they go, why aren't you doing that for me? But I did, like, you did it last time and you paid my bill last time. Why aren't you, you know, it's, it's all that stuff that, um, you know, you know, there's a certain amount of um, suffering in decision-making, but in the long run, when I put those boundaries down in my life, I'm saying no, no more. I've had enough. Because for once in my life, I'm saying, to thine own self be true. Nice. That is what we have got on our medallions. You know, that is what AA's story is, to thine own self be true. You know, even though I'm a, I might not be able to save my face and my ass at the same time, you know? I can't always be pleasing my partner when I want to say, no, I'm not doing that, babe. No, I'm not doing that anymore, you know? No, kids, I'm not doing that anymore, you know? And that stuff's really hard. No, Mum, I'm not putting up with your shit anymore. I'm leaving now. I've stayed for my five minutes. I'm out of here. Gone, you know? I'm sick of the 20 years of you telling me that I'm nothing and I'm always going to be nothing, you know? All this sort of stuff, you know? Getting away from, you know, all the shame-based dysfunctionality that we grow up with, you know, and um, and making decisions that, you know, will not only change my life but change the lives of people that I have an opportunity to help, you know? And um, I, I love AA, you know, and um, shit, I'll be dead you know, 10, 20 times over. I don't know how many times, you know. And um, it, it, Being sober is not easy. Living the program is not easy. Doing shit that I don't want to do, you know. I've spent most of my life in addiction and I've always done what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, you know. And if you don't like it, too bad. But again, I come to, you know, sobriety and, and I, you know, and I trust someone and I tell them everything and then they start telling me the truth about what I need to do, which is take responsibility and I hate it, you know, and, but I have to grow up. Uh, I, I realise today I must grow up or I will suffer and, you know, I, I don't want to be sober with a gun to my, to my mouth, you know, with a gun to my head. You know, I don't want to be sober and go mad because I've been sober and I've been mad, you know, and I don't like it. And, um, you know, in, indecision is based on fear. Most of my inventories are based on fear. Um, thank you. Um, you know, and so it's about, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to pick up the kit of spiritual tools Um Am I going to pray about it? Am I going to stop, think and pray about it? Am I going to ring my sponsor? Am I going to talk to an older sober member about it? Or am I just going to keep doing the isolating, the doing in my own head, think, 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 think myself into a drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does that work out for you? You know, like, it's shit, you know? It means relapse. It means coming back when I've dragged my butt, you know, like I was eight years clean, sober, 
And, you know, 10 years it took me to get what I have today, which is two years and four months clean and sober. You know? And, and I, I don't want to lose that. It's been the best sobriety I've ever had, but I've had to fight for it. I've had to surrender, surrender and surrender and surrender till the cows come home, you know, and um, and I've had to grow up and that's been the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And, um, yeah, I um, yeah, I just wish you all the best and um, enjoy the journey. Um, from um, The guys from the Sunshine Coast always say, you know, that the longest journey is from the head to the heart. And, um, you know, I wish you all well. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.